All right, ladies and gentlemen, the, well, will be a relatively straightforward episode 123 has arrived, and we're back at the very same place that our circus was no more than four days ago in universe. A little longer than that in real life. Uh, we are back for, this time, though, the 30 minutes of Le Mans, because obviously we're not going to do a 24-hour race. We don't have the facilities for that, even if Le Mans does. Uh, they save that for the real professionals, which we generally aren't that. Uh, however, because the Mons are very particular about what they do or do not allow a series like ours to do on their racetrack, the 30 minutes of Le Mans, which tries to position itself as a legitimate endurance event, requires legitimate endurance race cars to be participating. So, <clears throat> only FIA-recognized sports cars are accepted in this race, with some modifications to make it all fair, but a lot of modifications, as a matter of fact. And uh, the only exceptions to that are Super GT, and the track with that slide, because they're basically GT cars. I mean, they literally are, so it's in the name. So, <clears throat> yeah, without further ado, into the Le Mans, well, half an hour, I guess. We are green for the 30 minutes of Le Mans. Le Mans, um, Sofie de la Sar, or something or other. As the... <clears throat> The pack of GT or sports cars, just in general, because they're not all GT technically. Uh, scream towards turn one. There are a couple of actually new cars on the track for this race, believe it or not. Well, two, <clears throat> and then one that we haven't seen in a while. We're on board with Juan Santo and his CLK LM, CLK GTR, really, but with modified you know, wing wing plates and such to make it look more like the LM. It still basically handles like the LM from what I'm told, and I'm gonna take his word for it, because he's better at driving that thing than me. But, uh, <clears throat> looking further up the grid, uh, we see, well, an already damaged, uh, GTR R34, a Super GT car getting dusted by AJ's Genesis in a straight line. Uh, and that's gonna add more damage. Didn't hit, didn't damage AJ's car though. Yeah, we've not seen this car in a while. Uh, it was decommissioned for a while, but Hikari brought it out of the garage uh, once again starting this week. Especially since his brother Akira has done the same with his. He has done away with Made in Heaven, as there was just a, there was just a, what was the phrase they use? A fundamental lack of grip. Something that they just got really wrong with the way that car was built, that not even beat performance could seemingly rectify. And the new car, which is like only 70% new, Alice Carson debuts a 1999 NSX GT500 car, as opposed to running the same exact livery on a 2018 spec Acura GT3. Honda, Acura, same thing. So, <clears throat> now it is on the car that it belongs on, and it is currently leading the way. This is a Super GT127. Funny, the person who actually drives these cars is the one that not only got damage on the start, but it is losing ground on the front of the field. It doesn't seem like the gears are set up right. I'm buzzing the limiter at 180. It's not really enough for this track. That said, uh, Juan's CLK is lucky to even reach 180. The balancing system in play here means that the GT1s have... The GT1s and then also Ray Guy's Group C back here. Uh, fitting, fitting tribute in a sense. I don't... Obviously, it looked like this before, but... I forget the name, but 
I'll look it up in between or something. The guy that started the SDP Tyson team in Super GT passed away. <clears throat> he is not the only one that looks like that either. He also is very damaged. It seems he and Ibarzaki and Ay yeah yeah, half the field is banged up. But Santo isn't. He's gonna probably make up a few spots just based off of not getting wrecked. By the looks of it. Summers is damaged. These two are fine, but Taniguchi isn't. Bagstrom has to pit. Top three remain unchanged though, and they actually are basically nose to tail at the moment. How did Santo get an overtake done in the chicanes? What? This guy mystifies me, let me tell you. Yeah, because of the, like, GT or, you know, FIA-recognized car rule that Le Mans forced on this race, it sort of threw into chaos the whole concept of, like, oh, the team format and whatnot that we would normally have into these bigger races and championships as Santo just embarrasses the other endurance racing nerd in Milsan, heading through that little chicane. There's that downforce playing into it. <clears throat> yeah, as a way to try and keep everything balanced, uh, non-group three cars, so to speak, uh, are required to run medium tires for, well, basically for safety. Uh, too little grip could mean a lot of high-speed spin-outs that the hard tires would probably lead to. You wouldn't really have this issue on GT3. Three cars, though, they're not going as fast. Not that it really matters, since the GT1s and, well, and Ray Guy's Group C are also pretty heavily nerfed in the top speed department, as you can see. These things are running about, uh, like 60 to 70 percent power. I believe, I believe Juan is exactly at 70%. Meanwhile, the Group 3s are not only unrestricted in their horsepower values, but are actually given a bolt-on turbocharger that further increases their horsepower. So it's kind of like the GT3s have the speed of, say, the, of, say Juan GT1, but keep their regular downforce. Well, the non-GT3 cars, or in this case, GT2, I think that's what this M3 was, if I remember correctly. Because he's trying to hold off AJ to stay in fourth place. Yeah, it's like the trade-off of like power versus handling, and also really large fuel tanks. Uh, it is very possible that, well, nobody's tires are going to wear out because of the compound that Le Mans forces here being basically made for this track, and the fact that the track itself doesn't really have a ton of corners, per se. However, I do think most of the cars on the track are going to have to make a stop for fuel. Wands will not. As you can see, he's still not like 80% fuel uh, nearing the second half of lap 2. I might even near we're in the second half of lap 2, you do this. Yeah, so that's basically going to be the tug of war of it. Juan is going to lose all kinds of time on the streets, but then he'll make it up doing things like this at 120. And you can just see that the distance between him and AJ has been cut. At least in half with that, those S's. Juan Santo is going to live and die by the last sector. He's going to be okay in the first sector, but that entire east side of the circuit, he is just going to want to cry. The only car that's really any sort of balance between the two is, well, Pablo's GT1 car, because it doesn't have quite the same amount of downforce as, say, this G70 Group 3 behind it. But it will still have more power than Juan CLK given these current 
regulations and restrictions. So for the middle ground package, the Sen 3 is exactly what you're looking for. Meanwhile, the Super GT cars running at the front are the extreme. Even less fuel efficient than the Group 3 cars, let alone Juan Santo and the other non-GTs. But, I mean, they're already at top speed, just about. The power of these things are running, despite having about as much downforce as a Group 3, just a slightly less. Is obviously there to compensate for how bad their fuel economy is. Oh, this is an absolute cluster right here. I missed this. Again, against AJ, into offense against Sebastian Orleans, and moves himself back third. Or up into third, excuse me. I mess, mess of a commentary, and Santo is just kind of creeping up in the background. He's not going to be much of a threat on the straightaway, though, but if he can just hang around here-ish, he will be perfectly okay with that. Should be worth noting because of the extra arrow and everything, these cars are also better on the brakes. As you can see there. And obviously the cornering is going to do something. It's going to get a better exit. It's just going to kind of stall out so that we get back onto the straightaway. Literally just what must be the most agonizing game of tug of war for the Mexican driver. <laughs> see, he can do everything in his power to get right up to the back of the likes of Orleans and Unleaded. But just can't do anything with it. Oh, goodness me. Uh, I don't think Orleans knew AJ was there. I don't know how you missed this car, but I guess he found a way. <clears throat> and now AJ will be running the McLaren back down. As you can see, yeah, nobody's wearing their tires. You can see, like, little slivers on the telemetry of missing rubber, but... That's not going to be a problem within this the given time frame of this race. They continue to rub fenders heading down towards the fast right-hander. And AJ is just forced to back out. Orleans gets his elbows out, and AJ chooses to not get sent flying into the sand pit at top speed. We take a quick peek at the back of the field here and just kind of check in on a lot of the cars that got damaged early on. It's the same song and dance back here for the others. For Ray Guy and also for Blonde, who is also in this race. Taniguchi Racing Team is just about the only team in this race who wasn't, like, their numbers weren't exactly crippled by the disallowance of road-going cars because they had three drivers on the team racing with race cars in the first place. Akira and Hikari with their Super GT machines, or JGTC, and then Blonde driving this. Nobody else has even two cars, except for... Um, Black Stallion actually has two. Brant and Thomas are here. I think that might literally be it. We're to look at another example of that CLK's extreme cornering ability. As you can see here, you're just kind of sneaking up to the back of these two through the S's. Around the outside of AJ Unleaded and sneaks his car down the inside of the 650S. That's the muscle his way by as Orleans did not give an inch. But it wasn't left up to him. Juan was going to take that inch regardless, and now AJ will try to follow him through ahead of the Austrian driver and will do so. Everybody is super close together now. The field is kind of bunched up now that we're in the cornering section where the Super GT cars are not quite as good as anything else on the track, but it's not going to make too much of a difference. Around the outside, Santa's going to try on his Mexican compatriot. Cleanly through ahead of the M3. But now we'll get onto the back straightaway and that CLK will become extinct. Just about. right on board with Pablo and see if he can try and make his way back up to that CLK, but he got a pretty good advantage, plus he's going to have company here. AJ Unleaded is filling his mirror, kind of. I he was actually filling his blind spot, really. But you can see towards the end of the straightaway here, he is getting closer. He's not going to get ahead, but he also remained... No, he didn't remain clear of AJ. 
Edge kept his nose there, and that meant that Pablo really couldn't make the chicane right. He was gonna he's gonna stay ahead, but it's gonna basically allow Juan to get away and hang on to the back of the Super GT, the JGTC cars, rather than fall into the clutches of these three. That said, he's not really gonna stay with them either, for, well, very obvious reasons. 193 at the braking zone, that doesn't seem like much, but it is, believe me. They don't even have their gears set perfectly. And... They're still the fastest cars on the straight. At the brick- oh, contact! Akira overblows the braking zone and does significant damage to the pair of them. Yeah, just missed the braking. And... well, I, th I feel like if he tried to avoid the contact, he was just gonna probably just make things worse. But the two race leaders give each other damage just shy of the halfway mark. And this is basically an open invitation for one Juan Santo to pretty much have the race lead in about a minute or so. Not that he's going to be able to keep it very safely as Pablo, AJ, and Sebastian are making their way back to him at a very intense rate. There's that corner and grip difference. He doesn't even have to slow down much for that right-hander. He immediately gains like a second back on Hernandez and Co. Not the best run through uh, with Arnage. Doesn't really matter though, because he's gonna get to the S's and be relatively safe, even if Pablo gets ahead of him here. Doesn't matter. Yeah, uh, easily, like, average cornering speed of 120 or so. Flat through the left-hander. I don't think anybody's doing that here. Yeah, you, you can just see the difference, but now our two race leaders... Uh, their bumpers are caved in, they don't need that rubbing on the tires. They will have to pit. They can fill their fuel up, and they might be able to make it to the end from there, but they're still going to lose a lot of time fixing their cars, while, you know, obviously everybody else isn't going to have to do that up here. That's not really enough of a lead, I'm going to be real with you. Uh, that's like maybe a second and a half. That lead is going to disintegrate. Rapidly. Uh, yeah, see you later, one. Your time is up. And Age is gonna follow him right through. They both can't exceed 190 outside of the slipstream though, which is interesting. Orleans could not get involved in the battle, but AJ and Pablo will overtake the CLK driver for the time being. My voice is starting to get a little not not approving. But you just think look at their little fuel tanks down there. Uh, and then look at Juan's fuel tank. <laughs> He's still got over half a tank. We're over halfway through the race. You do the math. He is perfectly okay. Nobody else is. Orleans is doing better than these two. He's a just shy of half. He's probably doing some fuel saving. You can kind of see the way he's shifting and everything. He's he's a pro race driver. He does know how to do this kind of thing. But somebody like Pablo Hernandez isn't going to know how to do that, and I think AJ does know how to do that. He just isn't, because he's trying to get track position first, but he's just not been able to deal with this BMW in his face this entire time. Uh, the GT duo e exits 6th and 7th, having refueled their cars, what they believe is enough to reach the finish line, I'm assuming. Which isn't much fuel for Alice. For taking less fuel, did get her ahead of Akira, so if there's any merit to that, there it is. Akira also quite good on fuel. I'm surprised the, sil the super silhouette skyline is as good on fuel as it is, considering how primitive the thing is. Maybe it just has a really big fuel tank, I suppose. 
and also just like with uh, just like with Santa, Blonde's fuel tank is still basically full. All things considered. Really disappointing run for Hikari though. Considering he's the one who normally drives those cars. To be running 18th, having gotten damage right at the start of the race, and not being able to get anywhere from there. Sure, the other Super GT representatives also got damaged, but they're still running 6th and 7th, not in 18th. And here's Santo! And back up to the pair of GT cars, as they might have to be- oh no, they don't pit here. Interesting. We'll be cutting it close on this lap, I would say. But, no, I mean, I'm not the one in the car. So, I would assume that they know. But obviously, Pit Stop isn't even in the, in the vocabulary of Juan Santo on this occasion. Shame that it doesn't really matter, because he's not going to get ahead of him here, and he's going to lose them on the straight. He gets right up to the back of AJ Unleaded as we head on to the Mosan, but it just doesn't matter. He's going to have to just kind of hang out again, and, well... If he knows they're pitting soon, I'm going to rely on that. If he doesn't know they're pitting soon, which he... I don't know. I feel like Juan would be the type to know that kind of thing, the feel economy of his opponent's cars. He's so, like, rooted in sports car racing. That he would probably just know, like, okay, GT3s don't really have the same fuel economy as me anyway, and then we've added a giant super duper fuck you turbocharger to them to make them even with my car. I almost wonder if it would have been more even if we didn't have that. I don't think so, though. Yeah, the GT3s would have had better fuel economy then, but they also would have had a uh, top speed of 170 rather than 195, so... And they'd be on the worst tires, so... <laughs> yeah, no, the, the, tur the, the turbochargers were sort of a necessity. And here we head up to the S's. And see how much time Juan gains through here this time. He doesn't even have to think about, like, you know, taking it easy through here or anything. The tires are literally built for this place. And so is this car. Actually, oh, that's a rare miss from him there. I think you just might get away with that, a track limit to wear thing, but we also don't really do that here. And in go Pablo and AJ. AJ giving him actually a bit of a bump on the way in. Maybe a little bit of small frustration as he had been stuck behind the M3 for so long. And now Juan Santo has the entire track to himself, basically. Uh, he is currently going into turn one. His closest competition now would be Sebastian Orleans, who's just crossing the line. Yeah, those two are just now approaching their stalls, so they're not really going to be a threat. The Super GT duo of Taniguchi and Carson, they're only now making their way out of the last chicane. They aren't exactly getting the move on when it comes to passing uh, Zhao Jingwei either. Wonder if we even see Orleans push. He doesn't really have a lot of fuel in his own car either. And he's still short shifting everything. He got a really good run there. He's already up to 170. He's obviously pushing the tires, but he's not pushing the engine. Because I don't think that he can. Meanwhile, Juan Santo is still at just shy of half fuel with what will essentially be one and two thirds laps to go here. And the next lap is not going to end within the half hour time frame. So there you have that. Yeah, it was a 15 second difference between Santo and Orleans, two uh, professionals in and out of the Challenge Series. 
uh, going at it for the 30 minutes of Le Mans victory, and appropriately so, if I do say so. I was going to say that lap time seems a little lax. No, I just think that that sector time from before was assisted by a draft that Santa is not getting at the moment. And there you can see the difference in scale. Orleans has, Orleans has obviously been pushing the car in the corners, but there just isn't much you can do about the fuel, and for that matter, he still might run out. Meanwhile, Hernandez and Unleaded continue to slug it out for third. AJ seen an opportunity, but ultimately having to tuck back in. He's going to try and leave the splitter there, but Hernandez isn't having any of that. He skipped ahead to the final lap of the race, and it is suddenly pretty dark. Orleans ran a 342 to try and cut down that deficit. He would have picked up 11 seconds on that lap, and he's really pushing his limits on the fuel tank, but, I mean, he kind of has to. It's that or settle for fourth place, because Hernandez and Unleaded are right here. Unfortunate for, for uh, Alice and Akira, they... Well, Akira kind of took them both out of contention here. All their GT3s are accepting their fate and pitting, such as Jingwei and O'Reilly. And any other GT3s that uh, would have been behind them that aren't pitting, probably only don't need to because they had a, a lap to pit when they got damaged. Nice textures there. I guess nice lighting engine. Oh, that is just normal, isn't it? Yeah, that's the street lights doing that, ain't it? Yeah. There's a bit of bug in, a bug in the telemetry there. I'm not sure if anyone else noticed that. Yeah, there's Orlean's fuel light, and you can see he's frantically, he's like half shifting at this point. But even still, he doesn't need to do a ton, because he can get back up to Juan Santo anyway. He's still gotten in a lower fuel mix and everything now that he's gotten in Santo's slipstream, and he's still gonna go for a pass. Obviously, that's, you know, duh. This is still a race, fuel saving or not. But Santo will outbreak the McLaren. That is a crucial defense from the CLK, uh, CLKLM driver. CLK, whatever the heck. The, the Mercedes. Mercedes, McLaren, BMW, and Genesis. And three storied names in racing, and then an absolute pretender in the form of the Genesis G70. Orleans does sneak ahead. Around the outside goes the CLK. There's that better braking for you. What is this lighting doing? Someone help me. Oh my lord, that is stupid looking. Do you just get away from the lights? Just, just headlights only. While I'm trying to park his car in the middle of the road. <laughs> Create chaos, do anything you can to keep our wings away. It will not work. And neither the other two will also get ahead of him and kind of box him in. AJ will get ahead of them of all of them. Being able to take the unrestricted line through the right-hander. Santa will get back to second, diving it on Orleans through Indianapolis. But he's gonna lose even more time here on the final trade away of the racetrack. Time has expired about 25 seconds ago, so this is for everything. Heading back up toward the start-finish line. But now we have entered the CLKR's, CL whatever the hell's domain. High speed cornering. And he's not even taking it as fast. He's got probably dirty air off that Genesis, but he's still taking it quickly enough. Sneaks to the outside. Door-to-door -door contact. I don't think AJ knew he was there. I don't think he could have expected him to be there. Juan Santo is about to do it again. He's going to clutch victory from the jaws of defeat. One more break in zone to do it. And AJ has nothing to offer. Chicane 1. Chicane 2. Juan Santo will win the 30 minutes of Le Mans. Almost as if it was a prophecy. AJ unleaded second. Pablo Hernandez will round out the podium. A good day for Mexico. Not a good day for a JGTC car. 5-6, but they were probably the fastest cars on the track in this race. At least in the early going, they certainly were. 
But it is Juan Santo taking the victory. In spite of, honestly, probably a very BS like regulation system. I mean, we can very clearly see Ray Guy did what he could in 7th, but it did nothing to help Juan. Obviously, damage on lap 1 not helping, but down in 18th. Well, Sands another one that I think people probably expected more than 19th out of. Siegfried Brandt, he just kind of took the wrong car for the job. That silhouette was never going to do anything here. But, nevertheless, the 30 minutes of Le Mans is in the books, but we are not done here for this week of Challenge Series action. Believe it or not, uh, we will cover that in a moment. Indeed, we were not done there. You see, a lot of the guys of the Challenge Series, they didn't really like what was forced upon us to run the 30 minutes of Le Mans, a stipulation that no other track would have really given us. And believe me, we'll, we'll be putting that to proof later in the season when we go to other locations that will not require that. But Le Mans has this reputation to uphold, and I get it, but I hate it. And so did most of the other admins. So we uh, organized a more normal race at our good old home track of Fuji for those who did not bring GT cars along to, uh, to this week's competitions. Which is, you know, the vast majority of the series. So, uh, we have a 675 class race since... There are a couple of things new down here, and in knowing that, that was kind of what we decided on. It helps that one of them is literally an admin bringing one of the new cars. So, yeah. I guess I would say to get back to normality, I guess it wasn't really abnormal what we did before with at Le Mans. It's just, you know. The status quo is God. We are away from Fuji Speedway, and you can kind of see right off the get-go uh, our two new cars. One is a new driver, the other is just a new car, though. And it is a four-wheel drive front row. Axel Valentine doesn't agree to those terms, however. He will immediately get up to, the, to a second place, right behind his team owner, the former Thrasher. And there is one of the two new cars. I've mentioned it before. Uh, Thrasher it has a new 675 car since he hasn't had one ever since the uh, Special Conditions division ever opened up. And he uh, has his Rally Stally there, which, although last week we kind of saw it wasn't maybe the best idea. Uh, and it is also a half tribute to, uh, I forgot to look this shit up, damn. Uh, hang on. Yetsu Suni Chiba. Uh, IRL passed away ten days ago. Uh, at the time of recording this. And even in universe, that kind of winds up. And in universe, kind of breaking the fourth wall for this commentary here. In universe, week 123, so that's like, you know, 20, 27 weeks into the calendar year. So it is like late July, so. A month ago, it sort of happened in universe. And Ray Guy's, uh, well, his 962 always looked like that. But now just kind of more fitting that we have like two cars running the same week. Axel gets a little physical with his teammate actually to get ahead. Not quite what I was expecting. The other new driver on the track is in a, an Evo 9 in the form of Verena Senadina. Which sounds like a Harry Potter style, I'm gonna be honest. Uh, no, instead just somebody with uh, multiple personality disorder actually. Uh, the details of it are a little expensive to go into in what will essentially be a 7 minute race though. Uh, believe it or not, we are on board, yeah, we are on board with somebody, there is obviously somebody in this race, and we're supposed to be looking at, we just haven't done that yet. 
uh, Victoria Noir in her TVR Tuscan with a redesign going into the race. Uh, for those who are completely unaware, uh, this is a reference to, uh, I guess, her, her black heart form. Or something a little edgy to me. And just a lapse time, Axel Valentine. Working on making a bit of a gap. It is a Black Stallion 1 2, and then it's an NFR 3 4, as the two NFR drivers are uh, currently squabbling for that podium spot. Noir is probably going to get away with that one, indeed so. And then Yo is running fifth in her. You have two Evos in this race, one's a third gen, the other's a ninth gen. It's very split apart there, I would say. And Noir is immediately hounding that, that, uh, that, the, the fucking R32. Uh, I don't think Thrasher, I think Thrasher thought he was clear. He was gonna try a crossover, but he was not clear of the TVR. Or, well, the TVR wasn't clear of him. And now Noir will be off in pursuit of the other, um, God brain, the other Black Stallion car. Got about a lap and a half to, uh, get it done. More like a lap and two thirds, really. Now, other than like the debuting Senadina, this race literally is just like the the best of the challengers. Like this is like all like the big names all in one place. Nectar has damage again. I don't know how you did that. Battle for the lead, meanwhile, and it is very near grass. Behold a mountain, guys! There's a race going on. Uh, Axel managed to get his elbows out into the hairpin chicane hybrid. Not how, and Noir ended up helping her case by nearly missing the falling right-hander. Down the inside goes the TVR, forcing herself to be there and requiring Axel to change his entire line. And around the outside, well, the TVR will try to go. Not quite gonna work, Axel will cover all of that nonsense off. Patch is still hanging on to third place in the new R32 Mismo. Drag race, meanwhile, a drag race that normally I think the Pantera would win, but I guess Snore managed to get some momentum off of that final corner, nonetheless. Very aggressive braking from the Pantera. Meanwhile, Noir just takes the casual approach. We'll get a better exit, but it doesn't seem like it's gonna matter too much. I don't think she's gonna have an option. No. Axel's gonna cover that off as well. So we take it now to turn four. And the TBR has got better grip. It's plain to see that much, but Noir is gonna lose some momentum out there off the racing line. Axel again aggressive on the brakes. Doesn't quite it doesn't quite sweep ahead though. So we're gonna continue this battle. And we're still not done. We're gonna head back down to the hairpin. Axel barely allowing the space required to put a TVR there, but Noir not able to do anything with it. It seems like her best bet is either gonna try ambush tactics in that left-hander again, like she did before, or just try to win a drag race against the Pantera, which is about as dumb of an idea as it sounds. She's gonna try and do it here instead, and... Still can't get the exit traction. The Pantera just keeps getting the better exits out of these corners, despite traction being relatively at a premium for that car normally. Oh, Noir definitely got an exit there. This is going to be a drag race to the to the end. And the TBR is creeping out of time, though. Axel Valentine. Wins the drag race, those hearse purrs advertising his license plate, making all of the difference. And Thrasher will hang on to third. A 2-4 for NFR, and a double podium for Black Stallion Motorsports. And given what's happened in and out of that team, or in, happened to that team in and out of the Challenge Series, I think that's about exactly what they needed right about now. Not quite a 1-2, Noir obviously wasn't going to just let her competitors win, but... Uh, 
Axel still gets it done for BSM. Double podium. Thrasher obviously showing that this R32 is more than capable. And ninth place debut for Senadina, which doesn't sound amazing since she started six. But you got to figure. Look at this run. Look at this grid that we had here. This is like probably the. This is like one of the most, if not the most, stern and difficult starting grids I think I've ever seen. <laughs> Axel, Noir, Thrasher, Isabel, Dom DePrisco, Yo, Eric, Tyler, Nico, Honoka, Barbara. Barbara was 12th in this race. I should say something about the overall, like, competence and skill of this this grid in relative to the Challenge Series. This is a f fucking difficult race to debut in. So the fact she doesn't come out of this with, like, 18th place should be seen as pretty much a small victory. For uh, for Senadina, I'm gonna get like a quick look at her car because we really didn't do that much. It's not really a a detailed livery, we'll say, but interesting sponsorship. Uh, I believe that would be our first. Uh, ah, there's a catch-all word for it. Tyler would know it. It's 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 it is on his Supra actually, but it's like a really minor sponsor. I went past Tyler. Tyler's ahead of ahead of her. Yeah, you can see the little uh, little leaf there next to the rear tire. Uh, same sponsor on this Evo, 3G. Is it recreation or medicinal marijuana? I don't actually remember which one, but it's one of the two. And that's the only one that has sponsored anything on the Challenge Series thus far. And it remains as such, except now it's a primary sponsor rather than an associate one. So, yeah. That'll do it, though, for episode 123. Axel grabs the victory in what I believe was a 25,000 deficit ahead of Noir. So, uh, basically a, that splitter, that little custom front bumper hang, was the reason that Novak, Axel Valentine has won today.